A train collision is, to no one's surprise, a bad thing. Sadly, they are a very common event. On the most part, they are relatively minor, such as low speed buffer stop bumps, a train hitting something fouling the line, or even hitting debris like a shopping trolley. Obviously, these events are annoying for those involved, as it can cause delays and the like, but usually they don't cause any serious injuries or death. However, every so often a larger collision or crash happens, which sadly does take life. These types of disasters are the ones that get reported on in the news. Well, imagine a train collision within a tunnel. Now everything is multiple times worse. Now imagine one in a tube train tunnel. Now you only have access to the crash site through the affected trains. I mean, you can't just get access to the sides like you could out in the open or a wider tunnel. This would be the case of today's story. The 1953 Stratford Tube Train Disaster. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Forward. Okay, so if I had to pick the underground line that I used the least, it would hands down be the central. Us South Londoners would turn to ash if we went too far northeast. It's a shame, as I find the current version of the Central Line pretty interesting, with its automatic train operation based on fixed block signalling principles, the fact it uses kilometres per hour instead of miles per hour, and that it also goes really far out into the countryside. Anywho, back when our story takes place, the line was very much a conventional London Underground line in its signalling and rules and procedures. So much so, that... This disaster has a long legacy in the way that trains are operated on the network. It would be the initiating event to change even the way trains safety systems are designed. Now today's video will have lots of signalling chats so this is a geekiness alert. I'm also going to be using the original report into the disaster as the framework for the facts and figures and as always the linky will be in the description. signals, trips and stops. So today I'll be talking about London Underground's conventional signalling system, and not so much with its newer TBTC, CBTC, DTGR and ATP, ATC systems. You know the ones that allow for automatic train operation. So signals on the London Underground are pretty simple, and different from mainline operations. On the most part, they are two aspect signals, that is green and red green for proceed and red for stop or danger. Each safe stopping distance is individually calculated per signal for a train travelling at line speed. That is, if a train passes a red signal without authority, then the safety system would grind the train to a halt before hitting a potential train in the front. Now how is a train stopped, you might ask? Well, that involves trip cocks and train stops, but bear with me, I'll come back to this in a little bit. So being in a tunnel, one's visibility can be obstructed. As such, additional signals are added to warn the driver of the condition of the next signal. These are called repeaters. They can show green and yellow. Thus, green means that the signal is repeated is clear, and yellow means that it's at danger or red. Now, generally on the underground, there are two types of signals, automatic and semi-automatic. The former are controlled by the passage of trains using track circuit blocks and change automatically from green to red and back to green again, depending on the track circuit's detection of a train and the latter change to red after the train passes over its track circuit, but usually will require the signaller to return it back to green. This is done from a number of signal cabins spread throughout their respective lines, well, at least when the disaster in our video unfolded. So like all machines, signals have a non-zero chance of breaking down. As such, for any case of power loss, track circuit issue, light bulb being out, etc., then the signal will revert to a fail-safe position, i.e. at red or danger. Thus, there needs to be a provision for this, as well a train stuck at a red signal in a tunnel indefinitely would cause a little bit of bother. This is where the old-fashioned Rule 55 comes into play, known as the Stop and Proceed Rule. Now this rule has changed significantly in its wording t into the modern day, but the theory is the same, in that if a driver cannot make communication with the signaller, then after waiting a certain amount of time, 
1953 this would have been at least a minute, then a train can proceed past the signal at danger under its own authority. The train must proceed at such a speed to enable him to stop short of any obstruction there may be, as noted in the Ministry of Transport report. Now for the train protection system. So trains on the underground, even in the 1950s, had a very effective way to protect rolling stock in the event of passing a signal at danger, and that was the tripcock. This is a metal bar that is mounted to the right-hand side of the train on its leading shoe beam. This is then connected to a valve on the train's brake pipe, which after being tripped, is open, dumping the air out of the system, thus creating an emergency brake application. It also cuts the power to the train's motors. So what engages the tripcock? Well, that is the track-mounted equipment known as a train stop. This raises and lowers using pneumatic power. When the signal is at danger or clear, the train stop would either be in the up or down position. Usually, the train stop would be in the up position for danger and down for clear. The train stop raises three inches above the railhead on the right hand side and is then able to hit the tripcock. The system works pretty well, but in the case of a signal failure, the train will still have its emergency brakes applied when passing the signal under the driver's own authority. As mentioned in Rule 55, the train must then travel at a caution speed until the line is clear. This is vital, as if not, then one train could rear-end another, as you always have to assume that there is a train ahead of you. The rules for passing a signal under your own authority have changed on the modern day tube network, where if you can't make communication and you've waited a minimum of two minutes, and this can't be done at semi-automatic signals, X signals, or station starting signals, as well as several others. Now the trains used on the central line in the 1950s look pretty ancient by today's standards. These were the standard stock. Even though other stocks used on the network at the same time, such as the 38 stock, actually still looks pretty modern, at least when compared to the standard stock. So when the standard stock was designed, traction control equipment was very bulky, and as such, it meant that behind the driver, there was a whole control gear compartment. This also meant that passengers were actually quite a distance from the front and rear of a unit. The formations used on the central line at the time were eight cars, and some of the carriages dated back to the early 1920s. They were not too far off replacement in 1953, with a 1959 stock predicted to arrive in the early 1960s. Regardless, they were the stock on the central line, and they had Westinghouse and electro-pneumatic brakes a dead man, and that all-important tripcock protection. Now it's time for the disaster, so get your bingo cards ready. The disaster. So this is Stratford Tube Station, which is around here on a map. In April 1953, the area is under 10 years old, and the line has a rising gradient to Stratford Station. This is to accommodate cross-platform interchange with British Rail Services. After at Stratford, in both directions, trains then go back down a gradient to tunnel sections. For today, we're looking at three eastbound services from Stratford and Signal Alpha 489. I should say, it is the evening of the 8th of April 1953. Two signals are stuck at danger. That is Alpha 489 and the next signal, Alpha 491. 489 was the starting signal at Stratford and 491 was the next one on the way to Leighton. As part of the protocol, porters were posted on the platform to communicate that signal 489 was stuck at danger to the driver and to the guard, and also to give them authority to pass the signal at danger. However, and very much importantly, the porters didn't actually know that 491 was also damaged and stuck at danger. So train 39 pulled into Stratford and was given permission to pass Alpha 489. It did so being tripped in the process and after resetting, set off down into the tunnel. It pulled up to Alpha 491, stopped and began to wait for it to clear. Meanwhile, the following train, number 71, pulled into Stratford, was also told by the porters of the signalling issue and to pass the signal and descended down into the tunnel. The driver saw the rear of train 39 and stopped. Now there were two trains in a section of track between Alpha 489 at Stratford and Alpha 491. After some time went past, train 39 passed 491 at danger and continued on towards Leighton. 
Train 71 then began to move forward at a slow speed. Meanwhile, the motorman of Train 59 was just getting his permission back at Stratford from the porters to pass 489 at danger. He was told, the signal has failed, you are to pass it at danger. The guard gave the driver the bells and away they went past 489, tripping the trip hook in the process. Roughly a minute went by as the train pipe recharged with air. Driver Besley took power and the train proceeded down the incline. Bearing in mind, the driver wasn't expecting a train ahead, although it would be a possibility. Besley saw what he would describe as a cloud of smoke. He would claim that he was travelling at a speed of less than 10 miles an hour. Almost instantly after hitting the smoke, train 59 slammed into the rear of train 71. And this was at 4 minutes to 7 in the evening. The collision crushed the leading cab of train 59. The force of the sudden stop pushed the second carriage up over the first, causing it to telescope. The driver of train 71, after feeling the collision, contacted the substation operator by the pinch and rub method wires that ran along the tunnel wall. This caused the traction current to be discharged, as by design. The guard of train 59, feeling the collision, attempted to make his way to check up on the driver. However, his progress was hindered by the severely damaged carriages. Instead, he travelled to the rear of the train and made his way back to Stratford to get assistance from station staff. Driver Besley amazingly was still alive in the leading cab, albeit crushed with serious injuries. The West Ham Fire Brigade was on the scene by 7.15pm. Doctors and nurses from Queen Mary's Hospital and Wits Cross Hospital also attended, as well as staff from the St John's Ambulance Brigade and the Metropolitan Police. Many people would be trapped in the trains, with two remaining there until 2am. In total, 12 passengers had died. Nine were killed outright and three died in hospital from her injuries. Many, many, many more were injured and understandably traumatised from the event. Now the disaster became a logistics nightmare. Two trains were smashed up inside a tunnel. Not the best recovery situation, with normal services not resuming until 10am on the 10th of April. Of course, the disaster would require an investigation, and one would follow from the Ministry of Transport, headed up by Colonel D. McMullen. The Investigation Investigators poured over the wreckage and signalling in the area. The failure of the two signals was discovered, a failed train stop at 491, which also caused 489 to fail safe, as a kind of form of double blocking, that is, having two block sections protected. Damage from the collision led investigators to believe that the impact speed was far greater than 10 miles an hour, contradicting what driver Besley had claimed. In fact, he was driving at a speed to be closer to 20 miles an hour. The crash caused a lot more damage to the rolling stock than anticipated. It would lead to a serious consideration for future rolling stocks, where riding up on other carriages would be reduced. Just look at the 95 stock on the Northern Line with its rubber anti-riding bumpers. Investigators presumed that driver Besley had lost track of his speed and had coasted down the incline gradually reaching the higher velocity. This was still his fault, but a number of factors played into his assumption of no train ahead. The first was that the porters did not inform of 491 being stuck at danger as well. Another was that the porters did not inform Besley that there had only just been a few minutes earlier two trains pass that signal at danger. He was also not reminded to travel at caution, although he probably should have done so anyway. The main issue was that the procedure of passing a signal and proceeding at caution solely relied on the driver, and we know that this isn't always the safest option. Even the report into the disaster would state this. This method of working has been found necessary on the executive's tube, underground and surface lines, all of which have a very intensive train service and are equipped with automatic signals, remote from and uncontrolled by signal boxes. Generally speaking, it is only when stop and proceed working has to be adopted that safety is completely reliant on the human element, otherwise electrical and mechanical devices are provided to counteract its fallibility and to prevent collisions between trains. As a result of the previous accident in Stratford, Lieutenant Colonel E. Woodhouse recommended in his report that the staff should be continually reminded of the risks arising from the non-observance of the caution required by Rule 55G. 
This was met by the annual insertion of a notice in the railway traffic circular, and the last reminder appeared in September 1952. These are useful, but it is evident they are not sufficient in themselves, and that some more positive action is necessary. And that was long-term channel friend Zephyrus. Humans are fallible, especially in a restrictive site environment. Shockingly, it would take until the 1970s before a system would be employed. And this would be the SCAT. And no, this is not what you think. It's speed control after tripping. That is a system that limits the maximum speed a train can travel after being tripped. For example, tripping past a signal. The system limits trains to below 10 miles an hour for a time of 3 minutes. Although not perfect, it does work pretty well in enforcing that caution speed after tripping. So bingo card time, this is what I got, and for the scale I've put it at a 4. Do you agree? This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very windy and cold corner of southern London, UK. I still have this really horrible cold and it sounds like it's getting even worse with my voice. So hopefully next time I record a script I'll be feeling a little bit better. Anyway, so I have a second YouTube channel and Instagram and X or Twitter, whatever the hell you want to call it today. And I'd like to have a very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week to listen to me talk and watch my dodgy cartoons. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching. And Mr. Music, play us out, please. <laughs>